right. Well, Kirk Magleby, you are the executive director of Book of Mormon Central, uh, but your involvement in apologetics goes well beyond that, all the way back to the 70s, 80s, 90s, and beyond with FARMS, the Foundation of Ancient Research in Mormon Studies. Uh, so would you mind just telling us how you got involved in apologetics way back in the day and uh, what you're doing now with Book of Mormon Central? Well, I really had no choice. <laughs> How, before I left on my mission, I served my mission in Peru, and before I left, my dad gave me a blessing, and he said, eh, you will do a work uh, that will help the cause of the Book of Mormon around the world. So that was on my mind. I was blessed with companions who loved anthropology. So we'd spend P days going to museums and busy with college professors, and we actually wrote a book, uh, Scott Hoyt and I, I uh, before we left down there, that ended up uh, being modestly influential for um, a few years uh, there in the Lima, Peru area, <clears throat> all about some things we thought were interesting correlations between the um, ancient uh, civilization of the Andes and the Book of Mormon. I then get home, and lo and behold, John Sorensen has moved into my ward during the two <laughs> years I've been in South America. Uh, he and I became fast friends. Mm -hmm. And uh, then my former bishop, also my very good friend, uh, was Jack Welch's mission president. Oh, wow. And so it was almost like this was fated to be. <laughs> so uh, when uh, John Sorensen in, in 79 was contemplating retirement, and uh, he and I were sitting around uh, talking about, so what kind of an organization might we want to establish? Because he wanted to be supported in his retirement with some infrastructure that he was going to lose as he left BYU. And um, at that very instant, as we had gone through uh, some existing organizations and written them off and said, nah, that really wouldn't work, we probably ought to start something. At that instant, somebody sticks their head in uh, uh, John's office and says, hey, do you know that uh, Jack Welch just formed farms down in Southern California? I called Jack that night, and uh, that's where that relationship uh, began between uh, Jack, John, and myself. And... Um, I've been pretty much involved behind the scenes ever since. I've typically been the business manager, uh, kind of the operations guy, and uh, uh, haven't really been as uh, much in the public eye. Uh, but this is in my uh, genes and uh, something that I'm uh, passionate about. And of course, Hugh Nibley plays right into this. And uh, as a longtime fan of Hugh Nibley and Apologetics in the Book of Mormon, I've always appreciated those scholars, but now that I'm an employee of Book of Mormon Central, I much more appreciate the administrative side of it as well. Um, and so I didn't realize that your relationship with John Sorensen went all the way back to your ward. And uh, so how did you meet Hugh Nibley, the star we're talking about today? It was when I was a, a freshman at BYU. <clears throat> I was 1971. He lived at uh, uh, 25 East 7th North. Well, I lived just down the street on 7th North. And there was an apartment of, of young women that was in my ward that was right next door to his mm -hmm. house. Uh, so I was just walking by his house on a fairly regular basis. We all knew that was his house. It was a famous place. <laughs> and um, uh, then one day, uh, I was down about two or three blocks uh, to the south of that, and there was a little ice cream stand. And lo and behold, Hugh Nibley drives up in an old, beat-up Volkswagen Beetle. And all these kids start piling out of this uh, Volkswagen. <laughs> and that was the very first time I laid eyes on this famous uh, wow. Hugh Nibley. Wow. But, um, so did you start reading Hugh Nibley before you'd ever met him? Or was your introduction to his work a later development? No, uh, I read him in high school. Practically everybody I knew read him in high school. Uh, at least all, all the kids that were, that were headed to college and that uh, had uh, kind of an uh, intellectual bent. I think uh, I read a number of articles in the Improvement Era. Uh, then, of course, in 1971, we have the, cons uh, the, the coordinated uh, correlated magazines coming out. That's when the Ensign New Era, The Friend, began. And the editor of The New Era was Brian Kelly, and he was in my ward. And so he would bring us a steady stream of uh, just neat new stuff, things that he wasn't able to publish, things he was able to publish. And Brian Kelly published a lot of Nibley in the new era. I'm not sure that would happen today. <laughs> but uh, back in the, in the early 70s, uh, it was considered de rigueur for the young people of the church to, to have this kind of intellectual stimulation. So uh, I remember the time that uh, Brian Kelly came in and was all excited about chiasmus 
because it had just appeared in 69 in uh, the uh, BOA studies. Uh, he made sure everybody in our ward, all the young people in our ward knew this is important. Hey, pay attention to this. Uh, but uh, uh, I think that was my first introduction to, to uh, Nibley. I read uh, 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 The um, uh, World of the Jaredites, uh, Lehigh in the Desert. Uh, that was, I think, the first book I read all the way through from Nibley. And I was hooked. Um, I really liked, uh, every, I, I, I ended up having a personal collection of Nibley that uh, got me through high school. So it sounds like Nibley is intersected in your life in high school and in college and beyond. Uh, what, if you were to describe and summarize, how would you say Nibley's influenced your life overall? It has been profound. Um, the more I've come to know this man, the more I've wanted to be like him. So I was in Arequipa, Peru on my mission and um, Brian Kelly in the New Era published a piece by Nibley called Man's Dominion. This is a glorious uh, exposition of the way that the patriarchs, Adam, uh, uh, Noah, etc., used the priesthood uh, to have a beneficial, a, a, a benign, uh, a, a Christ-like dominion over the animal kingdom and over the, uh, the uh, natural world. And of course, Nibley's a very, very much a, an ecologist. Uh, it's one of the fundamental uh, core values that he brings. But as I'm sitting down there in Ikeepa, um, and I'm reading the Spanish Dominion and, and thinking about, okay, so how should I behave in the natural world? It was like, okay, I'm not going to be a hunter anymore. My little gun collection I've begun to assemble. All those deer I've, I've uh, been uh, excited to kill over the years. I'm done with it. I'm not, I'm not going to do it anymore. I got home from my mission. I gave away my guns. Wow. And there came a time when my two boys were... Uh, in their teens. And I said, okay, I've been derelict in my responsibility as a dad. They should have had some introduction to the shooting arts and, or the shooting sports. And um, um, okay, I had to go borrow a 22 from a friend and take him down to the rifle range and uh, let him uh, plink cans for a while. But I thought that was important that at least they have the experience before they uh, went off to, high, or to college to pull the trigger a few times. Uh, but uh, it was just not who I was anymore. I, I completely changed the nature of who I was because of that one article that I read. Wow. And uh, when people think of Hugh Nibley, they mostly think of his work in the Book of Mormon, Book of Abraham, and the ancient world. And their first thought isn't always his work as a passionate environmentalist. But it's remarkable that one of the main influences of your life was on this side of him, that he... Uh, had that indelible imprint on you. Well, there was a time in 1972 when we had just finished up at uh, BYU and we were getting ready to go on our missions and Paul Cox and Bruce McDaniel, Garrett Gong, the four of us, we took a trip up to the Washington Olympic Peninsula. And we were gone for uh, two or three weeks and just uh, sort of exulted in this glorious nature of this temperate rainforest, the, the wilderness beach, um, we talked Nibley. We had copies of Nibley in our backpacks in our, mm. it, as we were uh, going around uh, uh, tenting and, and backpacking and, and uh, so forth. It just seemed to make sense. John Muir, he was a, an icon, of course, of ours, but he was right up there because he'd been in the Redwoods. He'd been out there in the Oregon uh, 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 forests. And he was kind of a, a Henry David Thoreau type of a figure in, in terms of his relationship to the natural world. So, yeah, it was a very, very powerful thing. Interesting. And uh, in my mind, there's a connection, though maybe it doesn't actually exist. Uh, is this new perspective on environmentalism at all, had, did that affect your pursuit of uh, global poverty efforts that I know you were really passionate about? Well, yes, you, you cannot uh, spend too much time with God's creation and not care about human beings. And so uh, I've uh, felt a certain affinity in my career, my life, to uh, ancient scripture, the Book of Mormon, <clears throat> defending the faith, but also to the impoverished, the um, uh, disenfranchised, the uh, uh, people, especially among the Latter-day Saint community, who just can't make a living. And uh, it's a tough thing to be a Latter-day Saint if you're not middle class. Our religion was really designed for people who have enough time on their hands to, to be a volunteer um, elder quorum president, to pay tithing, uh, to be able to actually go out and do ministering, 
That's where our religion fits. And somebody who is so hard up for their uh, daily sustenance that they don't have time to volunteer, can't afford uh, to, to uh, actually be supportive, it doesn't quite work in the same way. And so, um, uh, yeah, the efforts I've had over the years to, to try to help alleviate global poverty around the world have been directly informed by this worldview, that this is our responsibility to be good stewards, good priesthood holders, to uh, 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 really uh, try to, in our lives, uh, reflect what the Savior would do if he were here. And I think Hugh Nibley comes very close to that Christ-like ideal. I really believe uh, that the fact that I've known Hugh Nibley over the years and had uh, a number of uh, interesting uh, relationships with him has helped me come to know my Savior better. Because this kind of behavior is not the natural man. It's not what we would just do given our normal um, uh, appetites and uh, passions and, and uh, so forth. You have to purposely want to be Christ-like. And it can be so easy to lose sight of that in our zeal and, and vigor to immerse ourselves in the ancient world and fill our minds with knowledge. It can be really hard to, or it can be really easy rather, to lose sight of living the life of a disciple and making sure that alleviating poverty is part of that. So thank you. Um, in addition, Hugh Nibley was really influential on your life, but how was he influential on your peers, your contemporaries? Well, everybody I knew uh, was a big fan of Hugh Nibley. We used to talk about Nibley sightings at uh, BYU. <laughs> um, we had um, a, a fun relationship while I was a research assistant for Paul Chessman in the old uh, Joseph Smith building. And Nibley's office was right down the hall. And uh, there was a steady stream of people that wanted to come and visit uh, Hugh. In fact, it got so bad that uh, the, the faculty had to start protecting him and the, the uh, secretaries in the department uh, tried, to, tried to protect him because uh, he was just so important. The work he was doing was so important. And there was kind of this notion, don't interrupt him. Let him just continue to do what uh, he's doing. Uh, but uh, there was a time when we went and tried to do a service project for Hugh Nibley because We'd grown up uh, being young women, being uh, in the uh, Iranian priesthood quorums, that one of the things you do is you go and you get your rakes and your shovels and, and uh, uh, trash bags, and you go clean up people's yards. Well, Hugh Nibley's yard could have used some cleanup. <laughs> and we go down there, a bunch of us, and we're down there uh, 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 beginning to prune and rake and mow and, and whatnot. And he comes out, no, 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 no. Oh, I don't want to hear Nestle Wilkinson lawn. Um, and I've heard that same story in sort of different uh, contexts, but many times from different groups over the years. So obviously we weren't the, the, the first nor the last to go in there and think, let's go do a service project because Hugh Nibley's house has kind of run down a little bit. And uh, uh, that just was not him. His uh, 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 worldview was at a higher level. He was not materialistic. He did not care one bit about influence or prestige or eminence or keep it up with the Joneses or uh, uh, just uh, sort of his, his uh, public uh, persona. He uh, wanted the things of eternity. It was the relationship with God that was important in his life. And uh, that's going to have a powerful effect. Uh, I remember a, a friend of mine who uh, was a co-teacher with Hugh in Sunday school. Now that's an intimidating calling to be a, a young <laughs> college student and your co-teacher in Sunday school is Hugh Nibley. Uh, but there was such a tremendous uh, a rush of people or, or just a, a big group of people who used to go to that ward just to hear Hugh Nibley. Uh, it got to be a problem after a while because um, uh, that's just not a normal thing to have a celebrity Sunday school teacher who draws a huge crowd and consequently you have standing room only in, for Sunday school in a Latter-day Saint uh, chapel, but that was the situation. And uh, he was uh, uh, profoundly influential among my uh, peer group. Our testimony was anchored in the Book of Mormon. We pretty much knew the Book of Mormon was true, e either intellectually, spiritually, or, or a combination of the two. But Hugh was like uh, the guy out there anchoring the big tent uh, by pounding the tent pegs and then putting up the guy lines to hold that tent so it could could withstand a hurricane. Uh, that's the way we viewed Hugh. Uh, he was right up there with the prophets. I, I was, uh, uh, I came in, into uh, my uh, identity when David O. McKay was the prophet. And then of course, uh, Joseph Fielding Smith 
And uh, then we have Harold B. Lee for a short period of time. And then uh, we go in there and uh, Spencer W. Kimball. And then um, Edge Taft Benson. And then on to Howard W. Hunter and, of course, Gordon B. Hinckley. We viewed Hugh Nibley almost at that same level as a prophet among us. And we were pretty sure the prophets thought highly of him. So the things that Hugh was interested in, we were interested in. He quoted Karl Popper a lot on uh, so, sort of the history of science. Well, we thought it was pretty important we had to go out and read some Karl Popper as a result. He was a big fan of Edward Mayer, who was the, the great German uh, historian of, of uh, classic antiquity. Well, we went out and read Edward Mayer to make sure that, that we knew. Why did he uh, uh, think Joseph Smith and Muhammad had something in common? Uh, we tended to uh, sort of view Hugh as this icon of uh, the faith-reason continuum. That here was a man who had uh, lived uh, uh, contemporary with us, but had somehow gone beyond the limits of just mere mortality. And of course he did, because uh, he'd had a near-death experience as a young man in Los Angeles. He oh, had I been to the other that. side. And that was glorious. Every once in a while I got to hear him talk about that, of, of what, what it was like to actually be in the spirit world. That informed his worldview. And uh, that made him a prophet, as far as we were concerned. And uh, uh, we purposely tried to become like him. He was involved in languages. Well, we thought it was important to go learn some languages. And um, uh, he was a big fan of uh, ancient uh, literature and uh, seemed to have a mastery of antiquities. So that was an area that we thought was, was uh, 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 something that we ought to spend some time in. We had to become somewhat uh, familiar with the humanities, with the classics. Uh, know a little bit about the, the uh, early patristic fathers, things like that, because Hugh was uh, going there. I, I, it, it's hard to overestimate the, the kind of influence that this man uh, really had. In fact, when I think back on it, <clears throat> I'm reminded of the scene in the movie Camelot, where King Arthur has this little kid, and King Arthur's you know uh, court is long gone, and, and uh, the, the knights of the Round Table are all off doing their thing, and some of them are dead. And King Arthur takes this little kid and he says, remember there was a Camelot. There was a time hmm, when there was this golden age of scriptural scholarship. That was, that was Hugh for me and for those of my generation. Uh, we'll remember this fondly uh, because it has become part of who we are. Well, his influence still continues today and we hope this book really helps propagate his legacy even more because it's very important. Uh, I graduated from BYU with a degree in ancient Near Eastern studies and almost every single classmate expressed that they were there because they had read Hugh Nibley or come in contact with him in some way or shape or form and they were inspired and excited by, by what he did and that's why they wanted to study the ancient world and so his work is absolutely fundamental to the work that we do today and we hope it continues for a long time. Well, I'm very pleased to hear that because uh, when we put farms together, when it first came uh, to Provo in 1980, one of the very first things we did was said, let's publish the collected works of Hugh Nibley. The reason being, uh, he had got us through college, through graduate school, with our testimonies intact, and we wanted to make sure that that uh, uh, influence was perpetuated into the next generation. So uh, one of the things that uh, uh, we did early on at Farms was uh, consulted him on a, on a regular basis, and he came out and issued a statement, which we then put on the masthead of the newsletter and sort of published far and wide. And that was, if you want to know something about the Book of Mormon, consult Farms. Of course, he had a really high, high opinion of John Sorensen, uh, Jack Welch. These, these, these were nibbly-type people. And... Um, so from uh, that uh, very moment, we decided, okay, it's going to be very, very important that we do a good job on this collected works. And up to that point, in uh, Latter-day Saint publishing, that was the largest effort ever uh, attempted. Nobody had ever done something as, on that kind of a scale before among the Latter-day Saints. So uh, I'm very, very pleased that it continues to have an effect today. Absolutely. If you could describe Hugh Nibley in one word, what would it be? Well... I would say that word is Christ-like. <clears throat> and here's why. Hugh Nibley was an iconoclast. He broke all the rules. He was a social critic. Uh, but he was also inspired. And he loved symbols. He loved 
parables. He loved a really good analogy. Um, he was prolific. He was uh, productive. He was saintly. He cared about people. He had the big picture always. He saw the eternal in the mundane. He was uh, a Renaissance man in the sense that he knew practically everything. He was a scriptorian. He closely read the scriptures. These are all qualities I find in the Savior. And uh, uh, then he was not just a man of letters, he was a man of action. So, uh, Hugh Nibley baptized Cressimer Chosich, for heaven's sakes. Here's this star basketball player that comes to play BYU, becomes a global phenomenon. And uh, Hugh visits with him, he joins the church, he baptizes him into the church. He was uh, a practitioner. You never, ever questioned where Hugh Nibley stood. Uh, he wasn't above uh, a little uh, a blue uh, streak, a little uh, coarse language now and again. Um, but you never, ever questioned whether he was in or out. He was always in. He was always faithful. It was always Joseph and the, and the prophetic uh, line of uh, successors after that. So loyalty, unerring uh, loyalty. I would say Christ-like would be my one word. Wow. And uh, Christ-like discipleship and Latter-day Saint scholarship don't always go hand in hand, but they should. And it's good that we have a role model in Hugh Nibley, that we can strive to be more, uh, to be better disciple scholars and try to be a little bit more like Jesus Christ. So we really appreciate you sharing your experiences and perspectives of Hugh Nibley. And so thank you for giving us My your time My pleasure. Today. Thank you. Thank you.